Hold up, AMD fans. I am just as excited to get my hands on this hardware as you are to buy it. But when it comes to AMD performance in laptops, I want to make a few public service announcements, not to scare you away, but just to do you a favor so you can kind of know what to expect and perhaps things to embrace once you get your hands on some of these laptops over the next 6 and 12 months. Let's start off with the GPU. All right, so those all AMD solutions with the, you know, 5000 series RX based uh, GPUs. Pretty cool. Let's start off with that. Now, it's no secret, or maybe it is to you, AMD drivers for the GPU, they're just not as reliable and consistent as NVIDIA solutions. Now, here's something that most of you probably do not know but I build desktop computers as a side side job. As a matter of fact, I had a client that just took delivery on a Ryzen APU desktop build that they're going to use uh, at their police department for all of, the, it's gonna be in their evidence room, right? They just took delivery on that a couple of days ago. So I'm very well up to date and I build machines. I have over 200 of them built just since 2011 alone. And I haven't built one with an Intel CPU in it for probably two years, so go AMD in that regard. But it's mainly due to the security vulnerabilities than it is anything else. And when it comes to the GPUs, when I build a gaming desktop, I gotta realize what kind of client I have. And a lot of them, most of them, 95%, expect a system that just works with little to no effort. And because of that, I will always put the NVIDIA GPU in a system for clients like that, which I said is nearly 95% of those people. Well, there's no, there's no lie about this, folks. The, the uh, AMD GPUs, they can be a little bit buggy. Now, tech-savvy people like myself are just going to use DDU for dis display driver uninstaller and completely wipe out all that old stuff and put on the new. And a lot of times that's enough. Sometimes it isn't. The MSI Alpha 15 laptop that I had reviewed last year, if you were to just search the internet for that laptop and then its reviews, you will see a lot of people return that laptop for a GPU, driver, display, crashing, errors, just a few key words like that. A lot of people do not want to mess around with getting their system to work properly, and NVIDIA just has a better track record when it comes to drivers for day one drivers, for beta drivers. Their driver team is far more robust and capable than AMD's, and that's a fact. Don't let that trigger you. The reason why this is important. Well, on a desktop, if I have a desktop computer and I buy, let's say, the 5700 XT, great GPU, but it's been known to have some driver issues over the last couple of months. Some people are getting them sorted out. Some people are reporting headaches. A lot of those people will take that GPU back and exchange it for green team and just go with the RTX 2070. When you have a desktop, all right, that's not a big deal. You're just going to swap out one component. Well, when you buy a laptop and you're dealing with this, well, guess what? You're just going to return the whole entire laptop, and that really sucks for the manufacturers. So everybody that's making these laptops with these AMD parts inside, they're probably a little bit nervous about this because they're going to lack some of that NVIDIA reliability. Again, don't let that trigger you, folks. This is just a fact across a wide range of people that don't want to tinker around with their devices, right? So that's not all I want to talk about, though. We don't have the tools on laptops, on mobile, to get in there and start doing some undervolting, let's say, for the GPU. The MSI Voltage Curve Editor is for Pascal and newer NVIDIA GPUs. You don't have access to this when it comes to the mobile variant or, you know, for AMD. Why is this important? Well, first of all, if your GPU is running hot, it's nice to be able to peel off some of that voltage. After all, these are mobile variants with the letter M after it. So there's no hidden trickery here with Max-Q, Max-P, desktop. You automatically know you're going to get the mobile variant. And kudos for AMD to ultimately sticking with that simple formula. At least then, when we get on the forums, you know, there, there's no hidden shenanigans there. You should know what you're going to get. should be quite obvious. But let's say you've got a GPU that is cooling just fine, but you have a CPU that's running very hot. And I tell people that, look, if you've done everything you could to that CPU to get it to run cool and it's not doing it, 
undervolt the GPU. And they say, well, Bob, my GPU is running just fine. I understand that, but oftentimes it's still getting excessive voltage more than it needs. And since this is a shared heat sink, if you can pull off some of that heat from an already cool running GPU that's already pulling more watts than the CPU is, you would be surprised at just how well doing this on an already cool CPU, pulling off some of that voltage, is gonna help the thermal performance of the CPU. And those that try it come back and say, wow, I was shocked, but it worked. I was able to lower my CPU temps by seven degrees Celsius just by undervolting the GPU. Yeah, exactly. That's what I've been saying. It does work. And that's why I have a lot of these tutorials on there, all in the name of just keeping the CPU cool. Thanks, Intel, for CPUs hotter than Satan's balls. Now, I bring this all to your attention here, just on the GPU side alone, because we're not going to get the tools to be able to do that and especially not so right away. So we're gonna be stuck at the mercy of one, the driver performance and consistency, and two, hopefully the thermal efficiency of those mobile variants to start with. But with that said, let's segue into the AMD CPUs. The seven nanometer looking good. I was pretty happy with the 3750H and its four core eight threads. And I scoured the internet for many reviews that featured that laptop without liquid metal. And it seemed to run obviously a little bit warmer than mine that did have liquid metal from HID Evolution. Duh, that's a no brainer. And it was still getting pretty close to thermal throttling, not a big deal. But as we move down to seven nanometer, well, you would think, well, this should be a little bit cooler, right? Not necessarily. They're just going to cram a lot more in there. Now we're going to get six and eight cores. That means thermal performance is still probably going to be quite warm. Maybe not a big deal until you factor in that the Intel's extreme tuning utility is not going to be compatible. That is an Intel based piece of software and throttle stop. There's not going to be a remade throttle stop for AMD CPUs. And this has been verified. I've already talked to the creator of Throttle Stop just a month ago and he said, Bob, I'm sorry, I just can't do it. I would have to start with a clean slate from the bottom up and this is all free software as a passion project and it's just not gonna happen. It would take a lot of work and this individual gets nothing for it. And you gotta understand that that is unfortunately the truth. A lot of this great software that we have, especially with Throttle Stop, well, we get to download it for free and use it and love it and complain about it, but there was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that went into this, a lot of time for us to be able to use it for free. It's just not gonna happen again on AMD, but I was looking out for you guys. I made the necessary contact, I had the conversation, and that's just not something that's gonna happen. Does that mean we are going to be screwed and not have any undervolting capability within these CPUs? I'll, I wanna be optimistic and say no, perhaps somebody's gonna come along and be our savior, but realistically, it's probably not going to happen. So we are going to be at the mercy of the thermal paste, the fan control, the thermal efficiency of the laptop, are these gonna be as hot as Intel? Probably not, but still six and eight core, seven nanometer, 4000 series AMD APUs inside of laptops. It's not exactly going to run cool as a cucumber. Let's not fool ourselves. And the issue now becomes, as you can clearly see now, when it comes to the GPU and the CPU for AMD, we really are at the mercy of what the system is capable of, what AMD's, you know, driver team is capable of on the GPU. We don't really have the option to take matters into our own hands. Oh, we don't like the GPU? Well, let's just swap it out. No, that means we're gonna have to go with a different laptop, right? And that kind of sucks. What about the CPU? Well, let's just undervolt it. We, we really can't. There is some tunability from what I was recently told with some software, but it only works on Linux right now. So that's not helpful at all. So let's just hope these things work really great out of the gate. And that's gonna be fun for me to test. As a matter of fact, it's gonna be pretty easy for me to test since there's no undervolting or tweaking or tuning that I can really do. And one other thing I wanna add, when you're looking at wattage, the wattage being pulled and the thermal throttle limits and the temperatures, 
These really don't translate to what Intel's doing. It's a different architecture. They use different sensors placed at different points, uh, T-junction or you know the maximum thermal throttle limitation on Intel chips is usually somewhere around 100 degrees to 105 degrees Celsius. On AMD, it tends to be much lower, but how AMD reads what they're getting thermally and the wattage that's being pulled is not always accurate and that's not necessarily a bug with Ryzen. This has been going back across many of their CPUs for several generations, not all of them, but some, and that's something that is an issue on the current Ryzen 3000 series. In fact, I believe Ryzen was doing this since um, the first generation as well on various desktop chips. So that's going to be interesting for me to try to translate that over to the consumer to let them know what's kind of happening as far as the performance metrics go and the thermal performance and the wattage. But at the end of the day, what you see is probably what you're going to get and fan control and the thermal interface materials probably what's going to help dictate the overall thermal performance in laptops. And at the end of the day, that matters the most. That's going to secure the longevity and just the overall fan acoustics and how hot these things get. Well, we don't have a lot of wiggle room here, so getting them to run cooler is always better. And without that tunability, again, we're sort of at the mercy of what we get day one. What would I like to see? Any manufacturers watching this video, allow us to change and make tweaks to the TDP and the voltage within your BIOS. And make sure you do it in a way to where people are not going to brick their systems. But man, if you could do that, that's gonna solve half the headaches just on the CPU side alone. And then we are again going to be at the mercy of the GPU performance, driver performance on that level on your end. But I think that's something that would put a lot of smile on people's faces and I'm not going to lie, I do think the future for these laptops is looking good, but I also see a lot of people returning them because at the end of the day, if it's running too hot, people are just going to send it back. There's nothing that they are really going to be able to do aside from putting new thermal paste on their machine, and most people are not going to do that. All right, folks, that's going to do it. Not trying to be a Debbie Downer. I'm just trying to give you a nice little public service announcement of the reality of what to expect on AMD hardware in laptops for 2020 and moving forward. That's going to do it. I'm Bob of All Trades, and I'll see you in the next video.